My name is Jody Middick, and I joined the Canadian Army in 1994 when I was 17. In 2007, while we were fighting in Afghanistan, I stepped on a landmine and lost both of my feet. It was an obviously devastating injury that could have ruined my spirits and left me with severe PTSD. But I managed to restart my life, start a family, and embark on a cross-country speaking tour I call Never Quit to motivate others. But there's always been a question that's stuck with me. Why did I leave Afghanistan without PTSD when so many of my comrades, including some people very close to me, are afflicted by it? That's why I went to Los Angeles to the Institute of Creative Technology to meet with Skip Rizzo and his team who are using virtual reality to cure this devastating and mysterious mental condition. Oh, Jesus God. Christ. <laughs> <Holy f> <coughs> Hey, it's Jody Middick, and I'm at the Institute for Creative Technologies at the University of Southern California. I'm here to meet Skip Rizzo, who's come up with a way to use virtual reality to treat PTSD. Right now, I'm locked inside the Light Stage X, which they use to digitize human beings. So let's go and meet Skip. Skip? Yeah. Jody. Hey, hey buddy. On, nice to meet you. Right. Is this your magic room? Before we jumped into the battlefield, Skip showed me one of their immersive virtual environments. So is this like the hollow deck on the on the Starship yeah, Enterprise? Yeah. Except there's a little more physical reality. Nice. We call it a mixed reality environment. Okay. Welcome to Gunslinger and the Clementine Saloon. Step inside and be transported to another time and place. You're in Colima. Once it was a good place, but now it's a dying town. Basically, it's a mix of virtual humans that you can talk to, physical props, ways of tracking the person, interacting and moving around. So that it, so the, the system knows where you're standing knows, and what you're doing? It knows exactly where you're standing, and if you look at a character, the character might look at you and go, what are you looking at? Where are you from? I moved here from Gatlin, Tennessee, many, many years ago. Shut the hell up right now! You shut the you? hell up! Be quiet, you idiot. So depending on what you say or what you do at different points, the story can branch out. And, and so this type of th thing can be can be used for soldiers as well. Well, not, not, in, this room, saloon, not in this but, room, but, but the same concept. You could set up like a squad scenario. That's exactly it. And everybody it. interacts with the soldier in the squad. A mix of physical props with digital content that That's awesome. can be reconfigured, that you can do group training. Uh, yeah. The saloon is pretty cool, but I was itching for some war games. Now, over here, this is what we came to see. This is ICT's virtual reality simulator that can recreate battlefield scenarios from Iraq and Afghanistan. Can you put it onto, uh, like I'm looking through a NVG? Skip personalized the VR experience so that he was able to recreate the night where I lost my feet. I'm starting to sweat a little bit. There's a variety of evidence-based treatments, and this now is hopefully going to be considered to be one of them. And it's an option. Right. You know, there's not a one size fits all. You know, somebody may come in and say, this is how I want to face it. Other people say, no way. You know, I want to, I'll just talk to a therapist, I'll close my eyes, I'll imagine it, right. put my own memories. You can see that I've completely stopped talking. Because at this point, I felt like I was back at war. Let me blow something up. Okay, I'm gonna back up if you're gonna do that. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'll make it off in the distance and we'll see if we can hear it. Jesus. Yep, that's real. Your vehicle. Oh, Jesus yeah. Christ. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to spring That's all right, that man, you just owe me a drink. How about that? <laughs> in five years, where would you like oh, to see these systems? In five years, I'd like to see this in every clinic and have it be available as a form of treatment, not just for service members, but I want to see it in the police department. I want to see it with firefighters. I want to see it when somebody's a victim of a, a school shooting or a terrorist attack, that we can have these kinds of simulations that are relevant for their trauma and make it so... Yeah. Soldiers don't have a monopoly on PTSD. No, no, right. we're learning off of you guys. Right. You know, and the, you know, the sad part about war is, of course, it sucks. If you can pull anything good out of it, it's that war the urgency of war drives innovation. 
and it drove the innovation with this. We never would have gotten the level of funding to create this from the civilian sector. So you guys are the test case, and when we move on to the next thing, it's gonna be using this kind of technology with civilians, making a right. difference for everybody. This looks like Kabul. Now that car right there, we can blow that up. I'm gonna ignite it right now. Oh, fuck. Oh yeah, I'm running away. <laughs> in five years, you want this in every clinic uh, to treat PTSD. So in five years, how do we use it to, to train someone to deal with stressful situations? This is the ultimate goal right now. The idea that we want to put ourselves out of a job on the back end right. by doing a better job on the front end. And we've started a project called STRIVE which stands for Stress Resilience in Virtual Environments. And what we do is we take all the content we've created here and we think about it like the back lot at Universal Studios. And now that becomes a set where we put people in various parts of the simulation and they're embedded within a squad. And each episode has a little story, a mission, and at the end of each one, something bad happens. And the bad thing that happens is stuff that gets reported to us by people going through the PTSD treatment. Like an emotional obstacle course. We don't stop there. That just sets up the person for the training in stress management, emotional regulation, rational, emotive therapy, if you will. The VR experience isn't perfect. Two o'clock, 400 meters. Oh, yeah. yeah. I found it really weird that I could fire the weapon on the truck, for example, but there was no virtual enemy to fire it at. Provide cover. But it still did snap me back into battle mode, which was a surprising experience. I'm getting goosebumps. Fuck. Call of Duty cost $250 million. I don't want to say the total number we had to build this, but it was like at least 200, 250 times less, okay? So we didn't have the luxury of being able to build every hair on a camel's back perfect. So we have to cut corners and figure out what is gonna give us the best bang for our buck that's gonna evoke memories. But what we find is that it doesn't have to be an exact replica of reality for it to activate someone and get them to start talking about the stuff that haunts them. Because in the end, that's what it's about. Well, just based on what I saw, like you definitely activated the right senses. Uh, my heart rate definitely went up. I was uh, when you put that bomb off right in front of me. Sorry about that. That was an accident. <laughs> don't don't be sorry because uh, you know it put me in in a, in a spot mentally uh, that I haven't been in since probably since I got blown up. So uh, thanks for showing us the system, and uh, you got some other stuff you want to show us, though, right? Yep. yep. Well, we can tool around and All right. show you. We'll take a look. So. What, can you tell me anything about the institute here? Like, Yeah, we're uh, part of the University of Southern California. And our main goal here is to work with virtual reality, multimedia, mobile right. apps. And we're sort of like the unholy alliance between Hollywood, the military, and <laughs> academia. All right, let's go see Ellie. Have you ever talked to a digital girl before? Digital girls. Not that I'll admit to. <laughs> so I'm in Ellie's office, and I'm gonna meet her in a second here, and uh, she's gonna chat with me, and I'm a little nervous to see how I react to a virtual counselor, so we'll see how it goes. We're in Ellie's control room right now, and this is what Ellie sees here. When Ellie interviews him, we'll see his reactions. So, how are you doing today? Feeling good, feeling pretty good. That's good. Where are you from originally? Originally born in Kitchener, Ontario. Tell me about a situation that you wish you would handle differently. A situation I wish I'd handled differently. Uh, my first tour in Afghanistan, I was a driver, security guy, and we were driving through downtown Kabul, and we were a two-vehicle convoy. And this is, this is one of my few memories of Afghanistan, the things I regret. We drove by a woman who was begging in the middle of the street, and she had an infant in her arms. And, uh, 
and you know she had the baby and she was hoping to get attention because she had the baby but she was sitting in the literally sitting in the middle of the street with all the tailpipes and the, the pollution and stuff and as we got closer I could see the baby was probably dead uh, but she was using him or her as a prop to try and get some more money and what I when I think about that I had the authority because I was the the senior guy in the convoy that I probably could have stopped, got her out of the road, and taken her to the clinic um, with the baby. And or if the baby was fine, given her enough money that she wouldn't have to sit in the middle of the street for the rest of the day or week or something. And we, the person we were escorting was a little bit important, so I didn't do it. And to this day, it bugs me that I didn't... Uh, I didn't stop and, and see what her situation was to get her out of the road because she she could have been hit and if the and literally the baby is brand new sitting there amongst all the exhaust pipe uh, pollution and um, but yeah that's the one thing I really regret that I've never that I wish I could change out of myself in Afghanistan. I just told a virtual reality doctor that. <laughs> He's integrated his experience uh, in combat quite well. People that are really um, challenged by their experiences afterward might manifest more distress. I think he, you can tell he's feeling it, but, you know, he's not killing himself over it, not beating himself up over it. It's a good thing to see. I couldn't believe how many stories this robot got out of me. I suppose it's easier to talk to someone that isn't real, because they can't really judge you or spill your secrets to their significant other later that night. What'd you think? <laughs> your, girl, uh, your girl is interesting, I'll tell you that. It's very quick you forget that she's virtual reality, to be honest. That's like, I knew the whole time, but at the same time, I didn't feel like I shouldn't answer any questions. You know, it was, we, can uh, see, we can see that on the, on the video, you were just natural, fluid, engaging, yeah. like you would talk yeah, to a yeah. person. Yeah. Well, I think you're onto something here, man. This is, well, this is awesome. This, this is the direction that we're moving in with all this stuff. I mean, really, you're, yeah. see, you're seeing the birth of right. a new way of doing things with technology. I mean, these are like the Model Ts right, right, right. of where we're going. After a completely wild day at testing out Skip's gadgets, I was eager to meet Sergeant Warren, a vet from Iraq who was successfully treated for a serious case of PTSD thanks to VR therapy. While he was overseas, his convoy was hit by an IED and his squad mate nearly died. Skip and his team, along with therapists at Veterans Affairs, helped him move past this horrifying tragedy. So I went through this thing the other day and uh, my heart rate started going up you know I almost jumped off this platform and set off <laughs> an explosion but you said you went through an older version yeah um, I went through probably about a year ago okay. and uh, it was a little bit more uh, primitive I guess you could say there wasn't as much interaction couldn't get out of the vehicle the graphics were a little bit uh, more Nintendo-ish than okay. <laughs> Xbox <laughs> when you started the treatment did you go into it with an open mind? At that point for me, I had been through a couple of different treatments just with counseling and medication and it hadn't worked. So I was more hopeful than anything. So I was very open to whatever they had to go on and right. they briefed me before, you know, this is gonna be really intense and uh, it's gonna really immerse you in what's going on. And uh, that got me, you know, a little bit nervous, but. A little bit. It, well, to be honest, I felt so bad inside that it, it I had no problem like going back into it just because I wanted to get better really, really bad. I was watching you uh, go through this scenario and I, yeah, I saw a lot of the same reactions I had. Was it, it kind of feels real, eh? Yeah, it really does. It takes me back there a lot. Uh, it makes me feel, um, I mean, the sounds really trigger me a lot. Uh, so when you hear the gunfire and the radio chatter going off, uh, when the bomb goes off in itself, I mean, that's just, once you've seen it, I mean, it, it can't do anything but bring you back there, I think. So, do you, can you tell me the first time you went through it? So, I went in there, Mariah was my counselor, and she was just, you know, sweet lady and uh, very inviting and made me feel very comfortable. So, I was like, okay, this is great. And then I just kept looking out of the corner and could see this, you know, the box sitting right here. And I was thinking, oh, 
I'm gonna be sitting on that pretty soon and getting nervous. And so when I did sit up there, she says, you know, okay, well, you now just start telling me what happened that day. So wow. she, she would, okay, she would yeah. guide me through it, like, trying to like, okay, wait, slow down. You're not to that point yet. What does it look like? What do the fields look like? So now they're making you go through it and not as a detached observer. Right. They're putting you back in the, in the actual place. As much as I can. And describing your feelings and your thoughts as you're going through it in a virtual world. Right. It, precisely. So I am uh, in Iraq. I'm on a no-name road, and I'm driving down a dirt uh, road that's surrounded by canals. Um, as I come up to the city, I notice that there's not many people around. Um, I get a call from my lieutenant, and he tells me that we've got a right-hand turn to make. Uh, when I make the right-hand turn, uh, everything went black. We hit an IED. And um, at this point, I uh, got out of the vehicle, and there was flames everywhere. I woke up on fire. Um, I turned back around to see the truck um, just engulfed in flames and my friend crawling out the back. I went up to him and uh, just did my best to smother him with um, dirt and my hands and my body, but nothing really worked. Um, he was soaked in diesel fuel. I just felt like um, this was the worst and most hopeless situation I've ever been in, and my friend was burning. And uh, then I saw the feet of the medic come running by, and uh, I crawled back around, and we were able to get Scott out of fire uh, with the uh, fire blanket and fire extinguisher and pull them back to safety before the uh, Umbi exploded with the grenades and AT4s. The end. Mm -hmm. The aftermath of pressure flight IED detonated November 25th, 2006. Lost some good men for the time being. This is nine weeks. Right. Right. So by the last session, how are you feeling going in? Are you looking forward to it? Are you, are you, do you know what's your, did you, did you know it was your last session? I did. I think by the time I got to session nine, what I had realized was that this wasn't an immediate fix. This wasn't something that after session nine, it was like, okay, your PTSD is yeah. gone and everything is, yeah, yeah, you're cleared. Yeah, yeah. Congratulations, you're fixed. Uh, I knew that it was giving me questions and tools. Um, to evaluate, you know, different scenarios that I've been through and this one as well that I was going to be able to carry with me and which I have carried with me and has it allowed me to really, I don't know, confront some of my terrors and um, what I go through. So going into session nine, I was, I was eager to, to find out what other tools I was going to get from it. Oh, forgot my eyes direct my... some clouds if that's relevant we try to create just a general marketplace and, and you'll see way up ahead there, there's a car don't get too close okay I'm gonna set off uh, a vehicle born IED in that in that car okay Wow you know and the crowd disperses right. uh, that guy wasn't phased yeah oh, no he's <laughs> he's a little bum now yeah he's bummed. <laughs> <laughs> this is Probably the most effective treatment that I've had in a. And you've had room. them all. And I've had so many, yeah. so many. Um, and I, I really do think that most of the soldiers out there stand to benefit from it. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, thanks for telling, talking to me about it, telling us your, your pleasure, story. Jody. And, uh, it's good to meet you. Yeah, you too. All right. I was extremely impressed with the work Skip and his team are doing at ICT in LA. I'm hoping this kind of technology can be transitioned into a standard training procedure that soldiers experience before they go and fight. It can only help. <laughs>